on the second part. And if you look at the material that I made available, there are these lectures and there is a syllabus. The syllabus is a little different from the lectures that I'm giving, but I still thought that that may represent some nice additional material for you to go through. Um, so don't expect that to go exactly along with these lectures. As I said, it's just some added material that I thought you may be interested in. And so what I will be presenting now are the diseases of the eyes. Again, this, I have a course that I teach the residents for a whole semester. So trying to put that into two parts is quite an interesting challenge. And I'm certainly not going to be able to talk about everything. So if you have any questions about diseases that I may not cover, feel free to raise the hand and we can then talk more about those. It's more to just give you an idea of how to identify diseases. And before I start, you may actually recognize this globe. I'm kind of just reorienting this section. Um, it is to remind you that we generally just look at one cross section. Potentially, you may then have a third perpendicular section. As I said, that's what a colleague of mine who now is a private pathologist and has to pay for every slide. So it's not, so he is very careful how much he trims in. And so he maximizes basically then what he can get on one slide by adding an additional perpendicular section. That's kind of like a half moon section that may be able to fit onto a single slide. But um, this is, again, to remind you that we still need to keep in mind that the globe is round, a closed structure, and so diseases that may start in the back of the eye, such as retinal detachment, they will sooner or later, because you have that closed environment, have an effect on the anterior aspect. For instance, that retinal detachment will lead to hypoxia and vascular endothelial growth factor release. And so that will then have an effect on the anterior aspect of the iris that is just free. There is nothing that is lining the anterior aspect of the iris. In the posterior aspect, we have this pigmented epithelium, but anteriorly there is nothing. And so the vessels that are close to the surface will then start reacting to that VGF and will then start budding and basically you start getting then a pre fibrovascular membrane. Secondarily, that can eventually lead to occlusion of the filtration angle. And so a sequela of retinal detachment can certainly eventually then be secondary glaucoma. Or you may have a problem that is happening up front. So you may have a uveitis that is sooner or later leading to occlusion of the filtration angles that will then increase the intraocular pressure in this closed environment and will then have an effect on the retina. And so you end up then with a the blind eye kind of as a secondary problem. So always keep that in mind as you are interpreting the changes then in relation to the clinical signs that you may be seeing. Another thing to keep in mind is that the eye is within the orbit and the orbit is bony and so the eye can only expand so much and then it will start pushing against the orbit. It's just like the brain can only expand so much within the skull. And so that may be what overall may seem minor changes that would still have severe effects onto the eye itself. And the eye is certainly important because it allows vision. If we lose vision, we are then dependent on basically others to help with nutrition, getting around, and so on. So it's a very important organ. And so speaking of vision, uh, there are several kind of structures that need to be transparent for vision to happen. So the first medium, if you will, that needs to allow light to come through is the cornea. The next one would be the aqueous humor, 
So that, as the name implies, is basically watery fluid that we generally lose as we trim the sections. Then we have the lens. And so again, that needs to be transparent for light to flow through into the vitreous body, through the vitreous body, I should say, so that we have light then basically reaching the retina at the back here and allow the image to form in that location. And so as if you have an animal that is blind or has reduced vision, um, that can happen anywhere basically throughout this trajectory here. And so again, we need to keep that in mind as we evaluate the sections and try to translate that into the clinical aspect of that case. So again, this is the perfect healthy eye that is well formed. And the first diseases that I will be talking about um, up to the break will be this group of developmental and degenerative diseases. The majority of the diseases that we see are degenerative, because that includes glaucoma, or then inflammatory and neoplastic. We don't really see that many developmental diseases, neither in the globe nor elsewhere, really, but they are still important. And before I will be talking about those, I'm going to just review the normal embryology, because if you have a series of developmental malformations and number of animals, and you're trying to understand where the problem is occurring, you need to have an idea of the embryology so that you know, was it a problem that happened early in gestation or was it a problem that happened later? And so let's review the embryology of the eye. And you have in that handout that I provided you in that syllabus, kind of a somewhat similar um, picture series. So um, remember that the eyes are intimately associated with the brain. And so here we have the forebrain. And on either side, we will have these optic vesicles that will be budding off. And these optic vesicles, they will interact with the ectoderm, where we see this localized thickening here, that is the lens placode. And so that gives you an idea that the lens will be arising from this epithelium here, while most of the, and, and at least the important portion of the eye is arising here from the neuroectoderm. And so here's a somewhat further stage of this process. So here we had a vesicle, here we have a cup. And so basically we have an invagination of this vesicle to where we form this bilayered cup, while the lens is the structure that is budding off where we had this lens placode here. <coughs> and surrounding all of this, we have some connective tissue. So here you can see the vessels as they are going into the structure here and basically then providing all the nutritional support that this needs, the structure and development needs. A further stage would be where this vesicle here buds off from the surface and is now a structure by itself. And so this cup is now a little deeper and is lodging the lens up front. And we have this skin then on the surface, the ectoderm. And again, a lot of mesenchymal tissue at this point still surrounding everything. As we look at that a little differently, those vessels that we were seeing kind of coming out here ventrally, we can see that they come out of a fissure that is completely open at the beginning. And so these vessels are sticking out initially. Here we have the optic nerve picture that corresponds to this vertical section here that again shows that this is completely open here where these vessels are sticking out. But over time, this fissure should close. After all, we want this closed structure as the eye then later on. And so this fissure starts being closed starting anteriorly and basically then slowly progressing posteriorly. So at this point here, uh, in the posterior aspect, it's still open. But then as time goes by, it closes it up completely and these vessels are now completely incorporated into that closed globe. So we will be coming back to some of these steps of development because 
coloboma, which is basically an opening or lack of fusion of layers of the globe, correspond to lack of closure of this fissure here. This is going back to looking at this in a two-dimensional structure. So notice how at the anterior aspect here, we have the eyelids forming at the same time that we can also already recognize better the other layers of the globe. So we have the mesenchymal tissue condensing around all of this. So we will have the sclera that will then be continuous with the portion of the uh, cornea up front. We have what was that neuroectoderm that forms the innermost aspect here. Remember that is that bilayered structure. And then in between we have this pigmented structure that corresponds to a very vascular rich layer that except for the albinos will also have a lot of melanin. That's why they have it here. Um, basically in this case here corresponds to this white layer. But that's what you would imagine as being a black layer generally as you look at the tissue section. So that will be the mesenchymal tissue that is really the only place where you expect to see vessels within the eyes once it's all formed. Though at this stage here you can see there is still some mesenchyme and that is best visible through these hyaloid vessels that we have in this region. Here the, it's a bit further in development. So here those folds of the skin form the eyelids that are still fused. If we think of ruminants, horses, and so on, as they are born, they already have these islands open. If we think of dogs, cats, and so on, as they are born, the islets are still closed. So in those animals where the islets are still closed, that means the development is still ongoing. So if you have a neonatal infection, let's say due to canine <coughs> hepatitis virus, um, that can potentially cause retinal dysplasia because, again, you have that ongoing development at that stage still. We can recognize that these structures are getting better defined. Um, the vessels are still there, so the lens really stays with these vessels around them, um, around it, until the very end. So if you look at the eye of a fetus, or again of a puppy or a kitten that still has the closed eyelids, you will then see uh, the cross-section of little vessels that surround the lens that is still in the process of developing. And then this basically represents the eye at the time of the opening of the eyelids. So you can see that there is still a virtual space where these vessels used to be, but the vessels per se should have completely regressed. All the mesenchymal tissue that we used to have should have completely disappeared by this stage. Because remember, we need to have all of this transparent so that light can come in and basically then have its effect onto the retina. And so the ideal is that by the time that the eyelids open and the animal is ready to basically go out on its own, you would then have a globe that basically looks well formed as we have it illustrated here. And so just to quickly review the anatomy, it's important that we name things correctly, mostly because we would want to communicate correctly to the veterinarian where the changes are occurring within the eye. There are two broad ways, if you will, how we can um, talk about the locations of the lesions. So we can look at the eye as having an anterior which would be this region here, and a posterior compartment. And so notice how posterior compartment is different than posterior chamber. A common mistake that I see people making is that they call the vitreous body the posterior chamber. That is wrong. It's the posterior compartment or the posterior segment of the eye that consists primarily of the vitreous body here. The posterior chamber is this little space here. Um, I have to try to keep my hand kind of uh, quiet here. It's basically with the, between the iris, that forms the anterior aspect of the posterior chamber, and the zonular fibers and the ciliary body processes here, with leading up to the lens. It's this little space here 
that corresponds to the posterior chamber that is part of the anterior compartment. And the anterior chamber is this larger space that goes from the iris basically then up to the cornea. So it's all this space here. So that's the space where we have the aqueous humor and we have the posterior compartment then with the vitreous body. So again, if you have changes back here, don't call them, don't refer to them as being in the posterior chamber because that would be confusing to others because that's incorrect. Now another way of looking at the eye histologically is through the tunics, through the layers, if you will. And so kind of starting from the outer layer, we have, I already pointed out before that we will have the sclera as the outermost layer that is continuous with the cornea. Then we have the vascular tunics that are generally the ones that are also pigmented, that will be kind of a layer that will be in between. Choroid in the back and the posterior aspect and then anteriorly, I already had pointed out the ciliary body and the iris. And then the sensory tunic that consists of the retina primarily, but remember that's the bilayered optic cup that gave rise to the retina. And so we have the retinal pigmented epithelium as being the other layer that belongs to the innermost aspect of the eye. <laughs> All right, so with that quick review, now let's talk about the different types of developmental diseases that we can have. So one that certainly happens very early in the process of development of the eye refers to a problem where we should actually have had two optic vesicles budding off on either side. Instead, we only had one optic vesicle forming here. This generally goes along with other malformations of the brain. As you can imagine, it's then other problems that happen at this level here. So here we have a sheep with cyclopia that in the United States very characteristically is the result of ingestion by the dam, so by the mom sheep then of Veratrum californicum. At day 14 of gestation, of the five month gestation of sheep, so again, that gives you an idea then of how early in the disease process you would, you would then have to ingest the toxin or have that damage occur that would lead to this type of problem here. So again, that would be basically where the problem occurred. Now, as I pointed out, that often is associated with other malformations. And so I think this one here kind of nicely illustrates they often are kind of little monsters that end up being born here then. And so cy the cyclops here is just one of the changes. We have a large proboscis here. So there was some malformations in the skin per se. We have palatoschesis. And uh, we often also have then cerebral anomalies of different types in these cases. Once we start recognizing at least the beginning of two optic vesicles as we have it here, where we can kind of recognize two corneas that are being formed, and here we can see that there is kind of a division that tried to form, the term to use would be synophthalmos. And so this is at least the beginning of the attempt of forming two optic vesicles. And so that was what we thought we were dealing with, with this little fold here. And again, you can get the idea that this fold also had other issues, not just these ocular ones, where we had these two globes here that were within this big orbit. We were surprised then, though, that when we ended up taking out the eyes, they were actually pretty much two separate globes, and were really only linked by this band of connective tissue but they're still sharing only one orbit. So we still call, refer to this as synophthalmus, but it gives you an idea that there is, as often in biology, there is this gray zone. There is a ray of how far the lesion may actually be represented or how far the development may still have been able to occur. Again, just be aware that um, there is this variation between this lesion here and basically what we had here, for instance. So uh, pestiviruses, 
depending on when they may end up infecting the fetus, and that could be BVD, that could be classical spine fever in pigs. They are a potential infectious cause. In humans, it would be alcohol that would have this effect. We don't really have to worry about that in our animals. Um, vitamin A toxicity is a nutritional cause that can potentially underlie congenital malformations in animals instead. Now, okay, we had the optic vesicles at least forming bilaterally, but we still may not have much of any of the globe forming. And so all that we may see in these animals is just a little slit at the location of the eye. And so this may be true absence of the eye, as it was in this case, where they looked at this histologically. So this one here is actually a rodent. You can see a very prominent Hardarian gland here. There was no evidence of the globe in any of the sections. So this would be a true case of anophthalmia. More often than not, it looks like there is no globe. But when you do the histologic section, or even as you're getting the structures out of that orbit, that seems to be empty, you may still find a little remnant of it, at least. So it, while clinically it may be anophthalmia, it actually is a case of microphthalmia. I think you have, I believe this one here, this one here seems to be a true case of anophthalmia in a little chicken. So it happens, but it's a lot less common than if you have microphthalmia, which in bovine has been discussed as possibly the result of um, palpation by often students that would not really be as they are checking the pregnancy of cows that would be a little too rough on the little fetuses, on the developing fetus within the uterus. But I saw a study where they compared the, the uh, prevalence of this lesion in cows that had been palpated, and they had a nice number of animals that had been palpated by vet students with no experience, and a group of cows that had been, uh, that had only undergone the gestation, the pregnancy check, by experienced veterinarians, and there was no difference whatsoever. So again, while it seems to make a good story, and a plausible story, uh, it has yet to really be proven that vet students would be potentially responsible for this kind of cheap elf lesion. If you look at those histologically, they often, these microphthalmic lobes, they often just are little cysts. And so we can see that here. And this blue structure is the third eyelid. So that gives you an idea of the proportions of this globe. So the third eyelid, if you imagine kind of a normal eye that's only a relatively small structure, um, that here basically it corresponds to, to the whole um, size of this globe. Um, we can still recognize some of the core right here. Generally, if you end up having some of the retina present, and then you certainly have the optic nerve present here as well. Then, and I will be talking about skin diseases that will affect the eye, um, certainly developmental skin diseases, as we have it in these albino animals, is one of those conditions. So what calls most of the attention initially is certainly these unpigmented animals among all these other pigmented buffaloes. But here we can see the eyes that are either whitish or bluish in appearance. Though if we think of rabbits, rodents that are albino, often the eyes are red when we look at them. So does uh, someone know why we have that red color when we look at the eyes of those animals? because of the vasculature, the kind of the blood that ends up shining through. So in these animals, while it may not be as red as you see it in those rodents and rabbits, uh, if you do the fundus exam, you would then still see that same reddening then in the fundus of those animals because the choroid that, um, and, and even the anterior uveal tract that should have that pigment that would not allow you to recognize the blood um, that is not there, and so that would then shine through. Now, another interesting kind of albino uh, case that we can see is in Dobermans. And so on the bottom here, we have the normal 
uh, Doberman. And so this one here actually gives you an idea of what the fundus looks like in these albino animals. And so here we have, they generally have photophobia and so are then always kind of with these squinting eyes. And the iris is very kind of whitish to bluish. And here they're highlighting then, and it's, you would have to go to the, to the paper to kind of better see the gonioscopy and basically the retocorneal angle that they're trying to highlight here. And then again, the fundus, Remember that the tapetum is above or anterior to the choroid, and so it basically then masks or hides the vasculature in this region, while here we see the choroidal vasculature very apparent in the ventral aspect. Now these dogs, so they are albinos, their melanocytes are not synthesizing the melanin that they would normally expect to have, but they still have melanocytes, and that they still have these melanocytes is apparent by this very high um, prevalence of these masses that they have in the skin, often in the eyelids, but also within the iris. And so these are, so here again, another mass where they are actually a little more pigmented than the rest of the skin, and also within the irises. So these are more nevus type lesions, so very superficial melanocytic proliferative lesions, but that is something to which they are predisposed then because they have these abnormal melanocytes. Now, continuing to speak with the eyelids, and the way how I have divided my skin diseases or my ocular diseases is from the anteriormost aspect to the posterior aspect. So as if you are evaluating skin, you should make sure you evaluate everything systematically with the eye, you should do the same. And so I always start with the anteriormost aspect, and that would here include the eyelids, and then I kind of progressively walk all the way through until we reach the retina or even beyond that to make sure that nothing gets missed. And so continuing with the eyelids, here we have a Sharpe that has all of this exudate because of these inverted eyelids. So we have entropion here, and here we have a case on this Basset hounds of ectropion. Both of them we have changes. In this case here, it's just more reddening and inflammation of the exposed conjunctiva. This Sharpe has more issues because the inverted eyelids will then have basically then those sticking eyelashes onto the corneal surface that can then cause damage, potentially corneal ulceration, inflammation, and We'll discuss more what the consequence of that is. Cornea globosa. So um, I don't have a normal horse here, but I hope you believe me when I say that this cornea is more rounded than what it usually should be, and that therefore the anterior chamber is wider. Um, so in this case here, this is an indication that it, that's a condition, so this cornea globosa is something that we see in horses that have this silver type of coat. So there are some, like for instance, Rocky Mountain horse that has this kind of silver coat, but there are also Shetland ponies, for instance, or Icelandic horses. All the horses that seem to have this silver coat are predisposed to cornea globosa that also has some iridal hypoplasia and lens luxation and lens cataract. So they may end up then developing ocular lesions that are clinically relevant, for which this change here would basically just be an indication that they are prone to. Now, a lesion that is rather interesting, more from a clinical perspective than really from a histologic one, is this dermoid here. So I think this picture nicely illustrates how this looks exactly like the rest of the skin. But here, rather than having the cornea as a differentiated type of lining over the eye so that it is transparent and allows the light to flow through, we have then this region that differentiated instead into the regular skin. And so obviously, depending on how large this dermoid is, it may then preclude the vision. I had a deer once where the whole eye was just a tuft of that was of hair 
that was at the level of the eye that basically represented a huge corneal dermoid that because it was so hairy basically then occluded the whole surface. So there obviously that leads to blindness. Another problem that these ones here may uh, induce is when you have these hairs and again are sticking onto the surface of the cornea, you will then end up with corneal ulceration, inflammation and so on and so that will then end up inducing problems. So the correct is to excise that surgically. Now this was one that they submitted for biopsy so here we have the little kind of portion of skin that they got from the cornea. We really need the history to make the diagnosis on this, if that's all that you receive, because it will look like normal skin. And so it's, that's why I said it's histologically rather boring, and it's histologically often not really something we get to see, because the lesion clinically, grossly, is just so characteristic. Herford cattle, are prone to this disease as well. So they, they have a predisposition to forming this type of lesion, which, as I said, is easily corrected surgically. Now, the dermoid can also be part of a number of other malformations, and so that was the case in this little kitten here. And so we can see uh, this large outbulging polyp here of hair that was just one of the problems that this cat had. You may get the idea that this was a microphthalmic lobe, and I think histologically it's more apparent that we have here this big outpouching polyp that, was, that had some haired skin on the surface, and that the actual globe that was really small didn't really have much in terms of internal structures. So we can recognize best here the uveal tract. There was some initial attempt to forming a retina, and I think that's what we are looking at here, but uh, there was no lens, so basically this cat was completely blind, not just because of the dermoid, but it's because it also had all these other malformations. A change that can be developmental, but may also be acquired, is epidermal inclusion cyst. And so this dog, this is before and after surgery. And so we can see this little, very well this delimited nodule here that kind of represents the area where they excise that. What that looks like histologically is represented in this publication here where they have a similar lesion in the llama. So that basically just represents a, basically a cystic structure that is lined by squamous epithelium. And so it's, it's hard to tell what is the true surface and what is the surface of the cyst if it wasn't for all this material that is accumulating here because this one didn't really have anywhere to go. And so these lesions here would be expanding and expanding until you basically would then excise that because of all the keratin that should generally exfoliate. And so as I said, this can be congenital or if something allows the epithelium to grow down in a damaged cornea, and then that epithelium gets entrapped within the stroma and gets to produce keratin that may end up then inducing a similar lesion as in an acquired fashion. Corneal dystrophy, that is not really something that we get to see as pathologists, that is more a clinical diagnosis because once the ophthalmologist would recognize this condition, which is generally in younger dogs, and it's non-progressive, um, often it has this kind of moon-shaped type of appearance, C-shaped appearance, but sometimes it may also be circular. Uh, it obviously causes some cloudiness, a little bit of impaired vision, but the dog ends up getting used to this lesion. As I said, this would be a non-progressive lesion that is because of some lipid or crystalline, other types of crystalline deposits in the cornea. And I know we had a case where that was just one of the problems that the animal had that came for necropsy. And we tried really hard to find what was causing these deposits. And it's really difficult histologically for us to identify them. If it's a stromal type of um, dystrophy, then there are also epithelial type of dystrophies that can potentially lead some vascularization to some reaction in the cornea. 
But for the most part, this is just the only change that the dog will have throughout its lifetime without any other clinical effect being. Now moving into the eye, here in the anterior chamber, we have these little strands of fibrous tissue. You can see that they are leading from the, kind of from the surface here of the iris up to the lens in this location here. If they are coming just from the very tip of the iris, they could represent acquired fibrosis. Um, if they are coming, so that is one way of kind of trying to differentiate, is this an acquired change or is this a congenital malformation? Well, in this particular case, it represents the, some remnant of the mesenchyme that originally was surrounding all the internal structures of the globe and that I pointed out should disappear. And so here we have some of those. And in this particular case, actually, I remember how disappointed the pathologist was that he did not see anything histologically. As you can imagine, it's very difficult for you to make sure that you get these in section, because they may end up getting lost. In this other section, um, we were luckier. And so you can see just these little strands of tissue. Everything else is normal. In this particular case, we have it extending over to the cornea. There is no significant effect, though sometimes they can have a little bit of edema or then cataract exchange, depending on where they attach. If you see that in very young puppies, that may still disappear. But in older animals, that will then be a change that is there for their lifetime. Again, it causes probably a little bit of vision impairment, but not really enough for the dog to even kind of have any signs associated with it. Now, there may be situations where these strands of tissue are actually associated with more changes within the cornea. That's not really as easily evident here. You're just kind of seeing that there are these multiple strands of tissue here. It's then more easily identified histologically where here we have the decimes coming and then we have this altered stroma with some fibrous, very loose fibrous stroma that is attaching here to the cornea. So these changes would then already qualify as anterior segment dysgenesis. So there we don't have the, I don't, there we don't have a clear separation of the lens often of the superficial ectoderm and the mesenchyme that also not disappear completely. And so you may then have different variations of changes that are present in these anterior segment dysgenesis cases. Hypoplasia of the iris or of the choroid potentially uh, can look very much like atrophy that is an age-related change and that I will show you later. And so here this would be the normal thickness of the iris and you can see how thin it gets here. Again, this could be an age-related change of atrophy. In this particular case, it was in a very young animal, and it was therefore interpreted to be uh, hypoplasia. This was an extreme form of a malformed anterior uveal tract where the whole tip of the iris was missing. And so what they are pointing out in this picture here is the ciliary body with the processes that are vis visible then in this particular case. And they should be hidden by the iris that should generally be covering that, uh, the ciliary body. So again, this would actually be a case of aniridia. So an extreme case of, of so not hypo, but actually aplasia of the iris. Now the, the, the irido corneal angle, and I will come back to that again later, because glaucoma is just such an important uh, condition that leads to enucleation of the eye. And so remember the irido corneal angle is where the aqueous humor will be flowing out, um, basically into the regular circulation. So the aqueous humor is basically just an ultrafiltrate of the plasma, and so uh, at least we tell the students if we ever suspect any toxicity 
to also keep the eye because that would be a representation of what you have in the blood. So if you're looking for levels of calcium, phosphorus, and so on, and it obviously will vary depending on how advanced autolysis is. That may, that may interfere with the normal levels. But also toxins or so that you believe may be circulating or may have been circulating can be detected within the eye. And that's because we have this ultrafiltrate here that of the plasma that corresponds to the aqueous humor that will be produced by the ciliary body. Remember that I mentioned this morning a ciliary body ablation that one can induce by using gentamicin injection. So they would then be going after this structure here to reduce basically then the aqueous humor production that then goes through this space here into the anterior chamber and then out through this region here. So having a well-formed iridocorneal angle is very important to guarantee that the outflow occurs in the same rate that the production is occurring. And so as you're evaluating an eye that is still in development, and so if a puppy and a kitten, for instance, that still have the eyelids closed, you may see something that looks like this, where there is just no angle formation with no trabecular meshwork and so on. But as the eyelids open, you actually would expect that at that stage you should have this very nice open meshwork here through which you would then be able to have the aqueous humor flow out of the eye. So that's, and we will come back to problems that will happen when this does not form properly. So that is kind of here to already introduce that. So again, we don't have that meshwork in this location. So instead we have the stroma of the iris just leading all the way up here to the end of the decimase that is being highlighted by PAS and that is branching in a somewhat irregular way. So this would then sooner or later lead to what we call primary glaucoma. Now remember that I had pointed out these vessels here at the back that should disappear. Well, that did not happen in this particular case. And so here we have a persistence of that hyaloid artery that in many cases is associated with persistence of this tunica vasculosa lentis or primary hypoplastic vitreous. And so you can imagine that this will end up, if you have fibrous tissue that is lining the whole back of the, of the lens here, that this will impact light from flowing through and reaching the retina. In this particular animal here, we also have other issues. So we can see all these retinal folds that are present concurrently, and this is not an artifact. They had already noticed clinically that this lens had a weird shape. So that is lenticonus, just one of the malformations that this uh, rat had histologically. Uh, this, all these vessels in the back of the eye, in the posterior aspect of the eye, they may still remain to at least to some extent in many of the rats or even in calves. And so you may end up then seeing some bleeding in the, in the fundus, in the back of the eye, that would correspond to these little vessels here, to this tuft of little vessels that remains in that location. Um, one way of referring to that is Bergmeister's papilla. And so if you hear of Bergmeister's papilla, they're referring to this little tuft of vessels that again can lead to some localized bleeding in that area. Now the, the lens may be affected and that is often together with many other malformations. So in this case here, we have what we call microphakia. So phakia, phacos, refers to lens. Uh, we may even have a globe that is aphakic, without a lens. But then you would always want to be sure that they had not done some kind of surgery or so uh, that ended up then being the reason why the lens is missing. Coloboma. So I had mentioned that before, that that is when that fissure doesn't close 
So it may be a problem that we may already see anteriorly in the iris. So that's what we have in these cases here. Uh, this one here is an Australian Shepherd that has this somewhat kind of modeled type of coat. So dogs that have this modeled hair coat, uh, primarily when you have two of these dogs that are being bred, one to each other, there is a very high chance that you will end up with these ocular changes here. Often the eyes are small, so they have microphthalmia, and they will also have coloboma then that is already apparent in the anterior aspect. Though more often you have only posterior coloboma. That is a change that is much more common than anterior coloboma. Here we have a raccoon, a set of raccoon eyes. Um, so we can get the idea that they are very small. So microphthalmia was one of the problems. The lens is opaque and that was a real change. So we have cataract change here. And now what really calls attention is the fact that we have these outpouchings. So these are the colobomatous changes that this raccoon had. So here we have a similar globe just where the coloboma is not as apparent here. But this is to highlight the change that we see in the coli eye anomaly, where in addition to colobomas, we also have a choroidal hypoplasia. And remember, the choroid has pigment. So with hypoplastic choroid, we get less pigment in these areas here. In addition to these changes, these eyes often end up with retinal detachment. And so you may then have hemorrhage associated with it, you may see cataract changes, and then secondary changes in the anterior aspect. So these globes often end up then with secondary glaucoma, and so end up then having to be enucleated. Fortunately, there is a genetic test, um, because it is well defined what the genetic mutation is that these dogs have. And so breeders are very conscious about testing their dogs so that we really don't see this change in the quali eye anomaly anymore. Now, here we have another kind of close-up, again, of this colobomatous change, just to indicate that basically this retina loses then its normal support, and so that's why retinal detachment is so often then an associated problem. So here we have, in this Wuhan's fixed globe, then this detached retina. This one here, so when Mike Garner talked about the snow leopard and all the congenital malformations that they are prone to, it reminded me of, of this set of eyes that I got. And there is at least one paper that nicely describes all the changes that these animals get. So uh, the lens is very opaque, and these are two eyes that apparently were small, microphthalmic. I only got the set of eyes and don't really have a good comparison for what the normal is in snow leopards. So the microphthalmia was a diagnosis that I had to believe them because I couldn't really confirm that myself. But the cataract, I think, is already evident grossly. Then also these folds of the retina, which actually the retinal folds would support microphthalmia because the retina would be able to stretch out and line a larger globe. But they don't have, the retina doesn't have as much surface and therefore ends up then folding up. So it's not true retinal dysplasia. True retinal dysplasia means that you have layers that are completely malformed. In these cases here, often the retina is, has all the normal layering pattern, but it is all folded up because it doesn't have enough space to stretch out. And then these globes also had some coloboma, as you may be able to get the idea here. And at the anterior aspect, where this lens is basically touching the opaque cornea, there was some anterior segment dysgenesis changes. And so again, multiple changes that are probably then related to this restricted gene pool that the snow leopards have. Now to the retina. So remember that I mentioned folds versus dysplasia and that we should really try to use the correct terminology. So it's important that we keep in mind how many layers are part of the retina. So nucleated layers, we have the ganglion cell layer, 
the inner nuclear layer and the outer nuclear layer. So these are the ones, the outer nuclear layer, these are the cones and rods that are capturing the light through the photoreceptors here and will then pass that on through the outer plexiform layer, through basically their terminations, they will end up interacting with these with other set of neurons in the inner nuclear layer, and they will then pass on the signal basically to the ganglion cells, and their extensions, axons, will be in the nerve fiber layer that will then go to the optic nerve. So keeping in mind these layers is important as we look at retina histologically. Now this represents the retina of a very young puppy. I think the puppy was just about 24 hours old, so a day old, where the retina is still kind of differentiating into the different layers. But this came from a group of pit bulls that had retinal dysplasia. And I think we can see at least the beginning of a fold forming here. So this would have been another puppy. It ended up, um, I, don't know, I think, I don't remember, trauma was the cause of death in this particular case, but um, we were pretty certain that this would be a dog that would have ended up developing retinal dysplasia or retinal lesions like the others. This was another dog from that same group of dogs. And so this one here, it's already harder to kind of imagine that the retina could stretch out and look like these layers here. So again, you need to have that jumbled retina with rosette formation that would be required for you to make the diagnosis of retinal dysplasia. And while in this case here, it seemed to have a genetic background, as many dog breeds are known to have, certainly canine herpes is a known cause, or BDD is a known cause of retinal dysplasia in animals, so infectious cause. This was of an older dog from that group. Here, it's certain, here it was a lot tougher to make the call of retinal dysplasia. And so we had this completely detached retina. And does anyone have an idea why this globe looks so brownish? So kind of light brown? throughout the whole posterior segment, what kind of histologic pigment do you think that may have accounted for that change? Hemocidrin, exactly. And so this was a case that had an indication already grossly of ongoing hemorrhage as a result of the retinal detachment. So as I said, this was a dog that came out of that group of pit bulls that was defined as having retinal dysplasia from kind of clinical follow-up on these dogs. But histologically, it was really hard to tell, is this a true rosette or is that just because we have an atrophied retina that is folding up histologically? So we are sometimes limited when we get these end-stage cases in telling then what the underlying disease process is unless we have a very good clinical follow-up and, and that information provided to us. I mean, this was believed to have started as retinal dysplasia, but again, I don't think anyone can make that call by looking at this and saying, yes, this is a rosette versus just an atrophied retina. So again, remember that with these developmental changes, it's, it's really rewarding to know the embryology because if you start like, if you have a group of animals that is presenting itself with recurrent developmental issues, having an idea, mostly if you think it is infectious in origin, having an idea where throughout the process the problem may have occurred will allow you then to investigate that further, to then define must have been an early pregnancy versus, or early term versus a late term um, exposure to a toxin, to an infectious agent or so, and so that you can then better investigate it from that point. Now, to just kind of show that there is certainly a fine line between true congenital malformations and what is an acquired change, I would like to point out this, uh, this condition here. So this is in cats, generally in very young kittens, that we end up seeing this type of change. And so this one here is, these pictures are from Dick DeVilsic's Comparative Pathology book. 
Um, and so where the arrows are showing, that is basically the limbus region where we have the beginning of the cornea here. I think that is kind of, can see that to some extent here too. But from there we have this big defect, a kind of almost cystic outpouching. That, and, and this intersection here is what is illustrated in this other picture. And so we can see here the cornea. So again, that would correspond to this structure here. And then the uveal tract, the iris. The iris is very cellular, generally in these cases. Often it is extramedullary hematopoiesis that accounts for this hypercellularity here. You can see how that comes out, basically lines then the border of this abruptly ending cornea and then bulges out here. And is generally then adherent to this conjunctival tissue that would be and, and that is often epithelialized that basically then forms the roof, if you will, of this outpouching cystic structure. So this is what Dicto Biltzig named feline early life corneal perforation. And I know not all the ophthalmologists necessarily agree with this, but I think there is still enough evidence to show that whether this is a neonatal herpes viral infection which is what he proposes, and that would be an infection generally when the eyelids are still closed, or whether it is something else, that because you, gen you often then also have histologically, we had at least one or two cases where we had some indication of inflammation and of some granulation tissue formation that really then indicated an acquired change over an actual congenital malformation. So people may have the impression that, oh, because they saw this basically since the kitten opened the eyelids, that this is therefore a congenital change. And I have, and I hope no one here was the one who submitted that paper. There was a paper that someone submitted to a journal where they had a lesion that looked quite similar, but still had hemorrhage, fibrin exudation, and so on, that they thought was a congenital uh, ocular disease in a pig that I did not see any evidence of true because all of these congenital lesions that we, that we see in general uh, they don't really have any hemorrhage at least not at an early stage of disease or fibrous tissue reaction inflammation and so on associated with it it's just that change by itself and that is it so if you start seeing tissue reaction in the form of some potential inflammatory infiltrate or then some regulation tissue, vascular growth, hemorrhage, and so on. I, it would, you would really have to convince me uh, that that is a congenital and not just an acquired change, that animals may have suffered even as they were born and potentially then had some trauma or so that affected their eyes. Or like in cats, herpes virus with, leading to severe keratoconjunctivitis is another possibility that has been discussed. So um, that's why Dicto Biltzig then calls that early life event. Um, that would still be an acquired change. Um, so just be careful that sometimes there is this fine line that we walk between what is truly congenital versus what is already an acquired degenerative type of case. So with that, I would go into the degenerative diseases. Is there any question on the developmental ones? Again, overall, they're uncommon. If they're sporadic in occurrence, they're uncommon. Unless we are dealing with an infectious, nutritional, or potentially genetic cause, then you would certainly kind of have the potential of seeing them occur more often. But knowing the terminology ends up being important, and so the syllabus that I said I provided is then a part to also just make you familiar with the correct terms to use depending on the disease processes or depending where the problem is occurring. For our residents, we always tell them kind of to some extent thinking towards boards, but then also thinking towards communicating correctly with the ophthalmologist or the veterinarian that just like for skin, for ocular diseases, it's also important that we have the correct terminology so that we know how to communicate what we are looking at. And so with neonatal diseases, that's important, but even more so with degenerative diseases. And so let's go uh, through these. So 
Again, starting with the anterior most aspect of the eye, here we are looking at a very thickened conjunctiva, and if you were able to evaluate this clinically, you would see that this material here is actually quite hard. Uh, they compare that to wood and call that ligneous conjunctivitis, then as a result of it. Uh, this is a lesion to which Doberman seem to be predisposed. Uh, Doberman that have a plasminogen deficiency. And so you would see that in the conjunctiva where it is often most apparent, and you can imagine that this dog here will start having problems with vision. But you can also see that in the oral cavity, in the pharynx, trachea, esophagus, even on the pericardial lining, they have seen similar type of deposits. That if you look at them histologically, this is a PTAH stain where all the blue material here corresponds to fibrin that is often to some extent an organizing in these locations. And so they basically cannot break down the fibrin that is oozing out probably as a result of some trauma in these locations. So ligneous conjunctivitis, if you ever come across this change here, we actually had a recent discussion about this where some people believe, because this looks like amyloid, because it is very eosinophilic, homogeneous, acellular material. And so a pathologist was under the impression that this is amyloid in these animals. Do a PTAH stain and you will see that it is actually fibrin. And so in these dogs, one should check for a plasminogen deficiency because that's generally what the problem that they have. Another problem, and there is actually a paper that came out, I believe about two years ago, in veterinary ophthalmology that looked at a series of these cats that have this bullous keratopathy. And so this basically represents an extreme form of edema that these cats have. And interestingly enough, all of these cats had some systemic disease that was being treated with cyclosporin. So cyclosporin was, among everything else that they looked at in these series of cats, the only factor that was significantly associated with, the, uh, with this problem here. And uh, we had one of these cats, um, Kenneth Pierce, at the time when he worked up this, ca this case series, was the ophthalmology resident at Michigan State, and so I got to see some of the cats that were included in his study. And they had one where they enucleated the eye because it was so far at once that they did not really know how to go about treating that. And when they saw the very beginning of the lesion in the other eye, because that's the frustrating thing of this condition is that that sooner or later ends up being a bilateral, um, bilateral disease. So they tried to put the conjunctival flap in an attempt to put some pressure onto this cornea that was developing this severe corneal edema. But once it starts, this process just seems to be going and progressing to a lesion that again looks like this, then on cut surface, uh, grossly. And here we have one of these cats histologically. And so you can see that this cornea basically is just melting away. So it's basically just severe edema that sooner or later will end up leading to complete corneal perforation. And it is the only thing that they could think of doing to stop this disease from progressing was the conjunctival flap, but as I said, that did not seem to work out. So it's just something to be aware of that cyclosporin-treated cats seem to be prone. It is not thought that cyclosporin may interfere with the collagen structure in some ways of the cornea and therefore predispose it to this lesion, but it's just unfortunate because it, it basically always leads to enucleation of these cats and is a bilateral disease. So either some of the cats ended up with euthanized uh, or you end up with an animal that is blind then uh, bilaterally. Now corneal sequestrum, that again is a lesion that is much more easily diagnosed clinically. And so here we have this little black spot right at the level of the pupil that histologically would then correspond to these brownish appearing corneal stroma that is completely dead. 
So you don't find any cells in this region here anymore. Generally, you also don't find any lining epithelium. This one here still had some, but generally it's just this completely bad pigmented tissue. No one really knows exactly what this pigment represents, but one thing is clear is that the Himalayan or Persian cats or those flat-faced cats, they seem to be the ones that are predisposed to this type of lesion, which is generally treated surgically though it will also elicit a granulomatous response around this dead stroma and eventually it will just slough off. So you could also potentially just leave it and eventually it will end up sloughing off. But then you have all that granulation tissue that would remain in the cornea that can be avoided by just surgically excising the area. In dogs, they have recognized what they believe is a similar case in one case at least, where again we have this completely dead stroma that clinically corresponded to this large well-defined lesion here. And you can see this one already had more reaction around it as we can see it here ventrally. Um, so this, in this particular case here, this was a dog that had keratoconjunctivitis sica. In dogs, and this is a slide that I added to this presentation just to remind you of what some people kind of consider to be a similar type of problem, is what is called recurrent erosion. And what is characterized clinically by this loose end of epithelium that lines an ulcerated area. And this epithelium has real trouble adhering to the underlying stroma because there is this acellular region that just does not allow that adhesion to occur as it should normally be the case. And so if you look at this epithelium here in the lower mag, here in the high mag, this epithelium just does not know how it should differentiate. Normally we should have a nice basal layer that is plumper and then the cells kind of get more attenuated until they reach the surface. Well, here it often forms these little islands and then they kind of try to differentiate towards both sides. So this is typical for this recurrent erosion syndrome that some um, people have considered to be somewhat equivalent to the corneal sequestrum in cats. Now, panos, that's another case that we generally don't get to see histologically because it's a well-recognized thought to be immune mediated problem where we have granulation tissue, pigmentation and inflammation that often in, in um, shepherds and German shepherd dogs, but certainly also in other breeds, kind of just keeps advancing over the cornea. If you get to see that histologically, the inflammatory infiltrate often blurs the interface and so that interface inflammation is considered to be typical of this type of condition. It often has quite a few plasma cells in addition to also fibrosis. We can see all these vessels here. Um, and so as that progresses over the cornea, you can imagine how that will end up interfering with vision in these animals. Now, this was a case that I think could have been attempted to be treated clinically, but it would certainly have taken a lot of effort and money, so they ended up just euthanizing the dog. The dog had bilateral ocular lesions, and I will come back to this again when I will talk about the inflammatory conditions. Uh, here right now, I'm going to be talking about or highlighting the corneal changes. You can see how opaque the cornea is here. Um, those were secondary to these outbulging scleral changes here. So in this particular case, the cornea had all these cholesterol clefts and associated fibrosis and histocytic inflammation. So this lipid keratopathy, or I guess you could also call it a granulomatous keratitis with uh, lipid keratitis, this is secondary to scleral changes. And so in this particular case here, it was a scleritis. And so I will come back to this again later when I talk about inflammation. But you can also see that next to melanocytic neoplasms, for instance. 
and it differs from the dystrophies, corneal dystrophies, where you may also see some lipid, because the corneal dystrophies will not ever be expected to have all of this secondary reaction. So this secondary reaction tells you this is an acquired condition, and you should be looking for the underlying lesion because it could be a neoplasm in the adjacent region. Now I had mentioned the atrophy of the iris as looking pretty much the same as hypoplasia. And so this is an older dog and so age of occurrence can certainly help you there. So here you can see all these holes. It kind of looks like this moth eaten tissue here. That is an age related change that you can see in older dogs primarily. Can you imagine that uh, animals that have uh, iris like this will then be more sensitive to light? But that is really the main clinical indication or so that you would see in these cases. So, iris atrophy. Now, um, in the iris, or I guess related to the iris, Remember that horses have the corpora nigra. I have been told that that compares to a baseball cap where you have kind of that structure that sticks out and that helps, that shields you to some extent from the light incidence. And that it probably helps horses as they close their pupil and have that structure on the dorsal aspect to just better control how much light will actually get into their eyes. Um, in this particular case, it's so prominent because we have a cystic structure here. So in this particular case, again, it is truly expanded because there is a lesion. I've seen horse owners that, I guess, never looked at the horse close before they ended up getting their own horse that got really worried because as they were then looking into the eyes, they saw this structure that they did not know how to interpret and thought it was a lesion. So be careful that you don't interpret regular corpora nigra um, because, as a lesion, because that's just a normal anatomic feature in equids. Now, cysts are a lot more problematic in dogs. There they say that from a clinical aspect, if they are as heavily pigmented as this one here, they do not cause any problems. You can ignore them. But if they are thin-walled, as you can see, several here sticking out behind the iris, and we have them here histologically, they often histologically end up rupturing, and so you only see then portions of them. These ones are characteristic of the pigmentary uveitis to which golden retrievers are predisposed. Histologically, there is no itis. So there is kind of, it's a little confusing for pathologists, because clinically, there is some protein exudation that then appears as aqueous flare that ophthalmologists or veterinarians will interpret as an indication of inflammation, but we don't see any inflammation histologically. I have yet to see a case that has any inflammatory cell. It's basically these cystic structures here, and then depending on the stage of the disease, you will see pigment deposition along the lens. You can see how that starts forming adhesions here. So sooner or later, because of these adhesions of those release cysts, you will then end up getting, in this particular case here, already iris bone day. So you will sooner or later end up with a dog that has a glaucomatous eye. Iris bone day means that you have basically a, a closure of the, of the radio corneal angle here, because it's, you have, and then you have posterior synechia, so adhesion of the iris in a 360 degree dimension. So the fluid, the aqueous humor that has been produced back here cannot go through anymore, uh, through this pupillary space, and so accumulates behind the lens. And so keeps pushing this forward to where you basically then have plastering of the base of the iris against the sclera here. And that obviously adds to the problem if not even what is up front here can end up being released. But this is a consequence, basically an advanced stage of what clinically 
what then often present like this, and what, what start with these little cysts. Remember, pigmentary uveitis in golden retrievers that will sooner or later end up leading to enucleation. It's a disease that I know several ophthalmologists are trying to understand that so that they know how to at least interrupt progression of the disease, but it's still undetermined what exactly leads um, to this disease manifestation and therefore how you can really prevent it or make it to a stop. Now, lens luxation. And so the lens that generally should be behind the pupil, you can see that it is dislodged here anteriorly. So lens luxation may be the result of trauma. That is what seemed to have been the case in this force. So we can see here, here on the superior aspect, we can see the iris leaflet nicely in front of the lens. Here on the inferior aspect, we can recognize it behind the lens, and this was a real change they already had recognized grossly. So this horse here had then anterior lens displacement that seemed, based on the history, have been induced by trauma. In dogs, you would want to evaluate the possibility that you're dealing with zonular ligament dysplasia. And the reason why this is important is because if you're dealing with a terrier, or some other dog that has this condition, there is a very good chance that there will be lens luxation also in the contralateral eye. And that can be a reason for glaucoma. So you can see the, in this case here, the problem is often seen in dogs that are a lot younger. And the lesion, as I said, will be bilateral. What you would be looking for in these dogs uh, is the presence of this, it almost looks like amyloid as well, of this very thick, homogeneous tissue uh, or the posin that is overlying the ciliary body process. And that is basically a reflection of what the zonular fibers that should be holding the lens in place are then looking like. So these will be not very functional. And so anything, any little um, kind of abrupt movement or so could then lead to lens fixation in these dogs. So remember to look for this, what Dick Dobilsik, who, because he sees so many cases, is then often the one who suggests then the, term, the terms that we use called lens zonular dysplasia. So let's talk more about the lens. And I would like to just remind you of what the normal <coughs> histology is of the lens. So there is a capsule. Uh, that is thicker along the anterior aspect than it is along the posterior aspect, you will see that more evident in older animals. And this comes handy when, as you're trimming the eyes, the lens falls out, because sometimes you lose the lens as you're trimming, and then you try to put it back and hope no one has seen that. But you may not always have been able to put it back in the right position. Histologically, you should still be able to tell if a lesion is anterior or posterior by looking at this thickness and this difference in thickness of the lens capsule. So it's the difference in lens uh, capsule thickness as well as also in the presence of this lens epithelium. So here we have a histologic picture where we can see this lens epithelium, how it comes up to the equator region. And there we can see that the nuclei basically then get dispersed and eventually disappear. And these lens fibers will end up then at the end just represent kind of a cytoplasm filled with uh, some organelles and so on that will get all compacted over time uh, towards the nucleus. And the nuclear sclerosis that we can see in older animals with some opacity. We don't see it as much as pathologists, as certainly uh, veterinarians would in an animal that is still alive. They may see some opacity in the center that just represents these lens fibers that keep forming over time and keep aggregating then towards the center here. So that will form the cortex, uh, or that will form the nucleus, and then we have the cortex around it. And so again, lens fibers, if you want to evaluate this very well, remember that I pointed out Davidson's solution is ideal then for that. <laughs>
So cataractous changes basically represent any change in that normal structure of the lens. Anything that will change that structure will lead to some opacity and so will then start inhibiting the light from flowing through. And so here we have a case where you can already nicely recognize that grossly. We have a central region that is still kind of more or less preserved and then we have a liquefied region around the whole circumference of the lens that corresponds to cataract change. Now, one thing, clinically, they can subclassify cataracts in a number of different ways, depending on how much is affected depend of the lens, depending on where it is located, whether in the center, whether at the periphery, and so on. I generally refrain from trying to apply that to a histologic section, because they're just looking at one single plane and don't really know what is happening elsewhere. And so, mostly in the US where we have to be very careful that we can uh, 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 confirm, if you will, from a legal perspective, what we are saying. Uh, I try to refrain from applying the clinical uh, classification of cataract to what we are seeing histologically. That also means that if a veterinarian tells you that there is cataract, and you do not see it in your section, it may just be because you did not get the section at the site where that cataract occurs. So you would then want to point out in your report that no cataract was change was evident in the however many sections that you evaluated. And then potentially follow on with the comment that the clinically observed change may just not have been, seemed not to have been represented then in the sections that you evaluated. Because I've already seen veterinarians who then kind of had some trouble in how they were defending their diagnosis towards the owner. And I certainly don't want to discredit the diagnosis that they may have made, just because I didn't see it in my few sections. Now, as I pointed out, it's basically any change in that normal structure of the lens that leads to cataract. And so here we have several changes. We have this sea of Basically, this completely eosinophilic homogeneous material that represents liquefied lens material. What very often is present are these globules that represent Morganium globules. And then in this particular case, it was a lens that had ruptured. So we can see all these cells that definitely should not be there. In this particular case here, the lens was still intact, but we can still see that there is proliferation of the epithelium forming multiple layers. And then also notice that here we are in a region where the capsule is very thin. And remember, that means we are in the posterior aspect where there should be no epithelium. And so that indicates that epithelium migrated posteriorly then in this lens. And again, that contributes to opacity as well. And this is a nice example of the so-called bladder cells that are these very large cells where we can still recognize their outline because they are still intact, they are just very swollen. And once they rupture, then we end up getting this type of change here. So these changes plus mineralization is what you would want to look for in order to make the diagnosis of cataract. Now, be careful that you don't overinterpret something like this as being cataract change. So you may recognize that I had pointed this out before as being one of the changes, one of the artifacts that we can see in eyes that have been overfixed with Davidson's. And so in the ToxPath world, where, they are, where the animals are often evaluated very closely clinically, they will then often feel more confident that something like this is just an artifact because there was no indication whatsoever that there was any change there while the animal was still alive. But uh, from our perspective, where we may not have that luxury of this close clinical evaluation, um, I, I really like to see multiple changes that truly are indicative of cataract rather than just some swelling as we have it here. Now, um, another neat change that certainly impacts somewhat vision um, is the asteroid hyalosis. That is a change, in this case here it was an older dog and that's where we end up expecting it to see primarily. 
So this, from a clinical perspective, will be kind of some glittery things floating in the vitreous that you may pick up in the fundus exam. And we would always be looking for them at the posterior aspect of the lens. So this is where they tend to aggregate. And histologically, they have this bluish appearance. They are thought to be composed of lipid plus some calcium, which explains then the somewhat basophilic appearance. And they have been seen also, so in older dogs, as well as in also in dogs that have, and we will be talking about iridociliary adenomas. So here you can see the tumor, and in those cases, it seems like we see these kind of changes most often. Now let's talk a little bit about glaucoma. And so glaucoma, again, that means increased intraocular pressure. And I already mentioned primary glaucoma, but then we also have, and that's often uh, more common, is the secondary type of glaucoma. Uh, we had a discussion, what would be the best term to use for these primary glaucomas? And I think everyone agrees that whether you say gonadogenesis, pectinate ligament dysplasia, um, what is most important is that you convey the idea to the veterinarian that it is primary because that means they should be evaluating the other eye since that would be compromised and could potentially then lead to glaucoma as well. We also have these open angle glaucomas which are distinct from these that are considered closed angle glaucomas. And then the secondary ones, because they are acquired, as long as the lesion that led to them is only in that one eye, the other one should not really have the same problem. So again, remember, the problem is in the flow of the aqueous humor that leads to its increase within the eyes. And so that can happen, obviously, let me go back to, that can happen somewhere at the level of the pupillary space. Remember that iris bombay and the golden retrievers with pigmentary uveitis. Much more common though, it happens at this level here. And so that's where we have to remember. And so here it's just kind of looking at it a little differently in that we have the cornea or the cornea and the, um, um, at least, like, no, here is the cornea and the, and the sclera. And so here is the iris coming down to the base and we have the space here where we would have a trabecular meshwork. And sorry, the Schlems canal is actually in the sclera. So this would be the scleral region here. And this would end up going into the uveal tract. And dogs and cats have most of it flowing out into the scleral vasculature. Horses are different in that a lot of their aqueous humor will actually flow out into the uveal tract. And so it is thought horses can still get glaucoma, and perhaps we have underdiagnosed that. But if they seem to get it less commonly, it's because they use primarily this other outflow tract into the uveal tract. And you can see that best if you have a horse that had endophthalmitis and had neutrophils being drained. These neutrophils will then often follow along with the aqueous humor quite far away into the choroid. And so don't diagnose that as a choroiditis. It's really just an extension of the inflammatory process that was occurring within the eye. So again, Somewhere along this path, whether it's in this area here or whether it's in the pupillary space, is where we should be looking for the change. And for the, regardless where the change would be occurring, sooner or later you get the effect of that intraocular pressure. Again, remember that closed chamber, that will then cause an effect onto the retina. And the problem of the retina, or the reason why it is so susceptible to this increased intraocular pressure is because the ganglion cells that are those neurons that will then basically take the message of the image to the brain are in the innermost aspect and therefore the most susceptible to this increased intraocular pressure. And just like neurons in the brain, once you lose them, they are lost for life. And so that's basically that synonymous of blindness. <coughs> So clinically, the way how that may manifest is as we see it in this dog with this very enlarged globe, 
So we have both palmas here and corneal edema. So rather than having a transparent cornea that allows you to look through and see iris and everything else, you have this very opaque cornea because there is fluid accumulating because it's kind of pushing into the cornea. Sometimes it's not diffuse corneal edema, but you see these striations. And that is then histologically associated with breaks in the cornea here. So that's what we call Hobbes stria. You have to be careful that histologically you make sure there is some stroma that really leads up to these free edges of the decimes because you can certainly get breaks of the decimes even just artifactually. So you need to have something that really fills this space here that allows you to realize, yes, this is a real lesion. And you may already have the history of Hobstria as we see it in this course. So yeah, you would then want to see what is the underlying lesion in these cases. And so this is a case of primary glaucoma, where if we follow, so basically what I use is I am following this pigmented layer of cells here, of melanocytes, to see if that leads me then to the base of the decimates, together with the rest of the stroma here. So that is then a criterion that I use for the diagnosis of primary glaucoma. And hopefully I can see the same change in the other filtration angle if I don't have even two additional filtration angles that I can look at. So there is a paper that came out, I think about two years ago in BedPath, that basically came to the conclusion that in chronic glaucomas, you cannot make the distinction between acquired secondary and congenital primary glaucomas. And I can tell you that Dicto Bilzig's group of the Kotlau lab, which is the one that gets to see most of the ocular cases, certainly in the United States, but also gets consulted on many other cases around the world, they do not agree with that kind of simple statement. So as pathologists, you should still try to see if you can find enough evidence of primary glaucoma. Because it's really important that you can then guide the veterinarian to go and do gonioscopy of the contralateral eye and then try to prevent, if they were to see lesions that would also go along with primary glaucoma, then to try to treat that eye in order to prevent or at least delay glaucoma formation there. So don't just use, I've seen pathologists then just referring to that paper and saying, I cannot tell primary versus secondary. That's the end of it. Um, so really, I would challenge you to still try to, to make your best assessment. So here again, if we use basically what I indicated, kind of the trick that I try to use is this pigmented layer of melanocytes that we generally have very distinct, unless you have an albino animal. But otherwise, you have a more or less distinct layer of melanocytes that if you can seem to trace that along together with the rest of the stroma of the iris up to the end of the decimates and hopefully see that change then not just in one but also in all the other filtration angles that you're looking at, then I would say, okay, here um, we have an indication that this is a primary one of this genesis, pectinic ligament dysplasia or so, basically primary closed angle blood formula. Another feature that may help, but it really depends on how far in the disease process you are, is identifying these foci of transmural full thickness necrosis within the retina. No one really knows exactly why that happens, and if you have a very severely atrophied uh, retina, you may not be able to look for that. But if you have a retina that overall is still fairly uh, preserved, in terms of the layering pattern, and you see regions like this, this is something that has only been seen with primary glaucoma. So again, that would be a further supportive lesion that you may want to look for if you still have some doubt between primary and secondary. In horses, it's really tricky to make the diagnosis of glaucoma. So we had one horse that I discussed with our ophthalmologist who trained in Wisconsin um, and, and is very careful in his histologic diagnosis. 
We had a horse that had a filtration angle that kind of looked like this. The pectinate ligament in horses is normally very prominent. So the thickness of the pectinate ligament didn't really strike me as much as something unusual as the way how the decimates, and here again we are looking at the PAS section, how that was hugging and kind of then following along in this filtration angle. This horse had a history of glaucoma, and if you look at this retina, we can identify the outer nuclear layer, a thin inner nuclear layer, and there was not really, obviously here I only have a very short segment, but there was pretty much no ganglion cell. And so that fit the diagnosis of glaucoma, and there was nothing else. And so we ended up then interpreting that this represented a case of primary uh, glaucoma in this particular horse. Now we also have the cases of open angle glaucoma, and so those are often the most difficult to diagnose because you cannot really identify any obvious reason for aqueous humor to accumulate within the eye, though you may have very distinct cupping of the optic nerve, that would really in, kind of is one of the lesions that we look for in these cases of glaucoma. Um, in cats, particularly, you would then only see some reduction in the ganglion cells, but often the rest of the retina remains preserved. And cats are among those that get most commonly these open angle glaucomas. And so it's thought that it's probably some change in the extracellular matrix that is impairing the outflow of the aqueous humor. So in cats, you may even then see some change that looks like edema, but again, it's thought to be that change in the extracellular matrix that surrounds the vasculature in the sclera. In dogs, it's thought that it's probably primarily within the trabecular meshwork. Um, and dogs primarily are being used as a model for the open angle glaucoma in humans, which is a real problem in human medicine. Now these are among those dogs with open angle glaucoma. So these represent some beagles, and these represent some neonatal beagles, and it's definitely abnormal that one can already identify the eyes because they obviously should still have their eyelid closed. These had huge, so really bophthalmic eyes. Uh, we could not really tell any morphologic change that would have accounted for this, but again, it may just be that change in the extracellular matrix that sometimes is already evident then in utero, I guess, to a point where they are born then with primary open angle glaucoma. Now in terms of secondary glaucoma, which is much more common overall, um, this highlights the fact that many of them are a consequence of uveitis. So you have inflammation, that eventually then leads to uh, fibrovascular tissue proliferation that will impair the aqueous humor outflow. And so often that ends up happening at the level of the iridocorneal angle, though it certainly could then also be a reason why you get pupillary blockage as well. And again, if you have this in a 360 degree angle, then you may end up with um, Iris Bombay that I showed before. Now, an additional type of glaucoma that Dick Dobilsik has recognized is what he calls this aqueous humor misdirection syndrome, and I will show in the next slide why he calls it that. But these cats again have this, what one could also call cornea globosa, these outpouching cornea in relation to or uh, sorry, uh, this certainly looks like cornea globosa, but in this case here, it's actually the normal one versus the affected where the, where the anterior chamber is actually narrower. And the reason for that is because the iris and everything else is being pushed forward by this vitreous body here that is being displaced because we have aqueous humor that should be going forward into the anterior chamber is actually leaking posteriorly, and so all these clear spaces here represent the aqueous humor that is then this placing this jelly-like body and, as I said, basically then pushing everything forward. So this, because of this misdirection of the aqueous humor, 
is then why Dikto Biltzig provided the name of aqueous humor misdirection syndrome as a problem that he has recognized in cats. Now, glaucoma is really the only thing that will lead to inner retinal atrophy. And so again, that represents the loss of these ganglion cells primarily. And cats and horses, that's all that you will end up seeing. In dogs is where you may see the lesion, the atrophy getting more severe. And so generally not as severe in the tapetal region. No one really knows exactly why but it's in the non tapetal region, and that's why, again, why that vertical sectioning of the globe is so important, so you get to evaluate these two and compare and contrast, because it's in the non tapetal region where we generally see the more advanced atrophies of the retina. And the more atrophied the retina, the less likely you will be able to evaluate for that focal, uh, full thickness atrophy that is so typical of primary glaucoma. And you may still want to look for it if you suspect goniodysgenesis. Now in rodents, something that is easily overlooked because people don't remember to look for all the layers of the retina is the outer retinal atrophy. And so here we have the ganglion cell layer and here we have the inner nuclear layer, but that is the end. And there certainly should be more to the retina. So there are a number of strains of mice that have the RD1 gene that predisposes them to this retinal atrophy. And in the past, they have done some behavioral studies using these mice. And as they were changing their behavior because they were getting blind, they were interpreting that change in behavior as a result of their study. So certainly as you are doing research or as you're working with a researcher, you may want to be careful what kind of mouse strain that you are going to use so that you don't misinterpret something related to your treatment if it's actually just um, pathologic. This sheep here had ingested bracken fern and so this is often clinically referred to as blind, uh, blindness and so we can see how basically this is a normal sheep where you can still recognize the photoreceptors and so on and this is a sheep that has a completely atrophied retina. Now, I can say that in Brazil, where we have a lot of bracken fern, I've never seen this disease manifestation of bracken fern toxicity, but I've seen sheep with similar type of lesions in a more advanced stage of cloisantel toxicity. So that's basically kind of what they would use as an alternative uh, for uh, helminth treatment and they have made the mistakes in some situations where they gave 10 times more to the sheep than the dose that they should have and so they end up inducing it's an axonal degeneration in an acute stage you will see baculation in the optic nerve and within the retina but if you keep those sheep for a while you will also end up then with a completely atrophied retina and those sheep are basically blind for life. What we have seen in horses, and we have tried to relate that to herpes virus, but have yet to really confirm that, is what is called paving stone um, degeneration of the retina. That is really something that is best characterized in humans, and that is characterized by loss of the retinal pigment epithelium. So here we have the retinal pigment epithelium, and that gets lost. You cannot really follow it along until you can see it again where the retina is detached. And so in these regions here, the retina is detached, highlighting the presence of this layer. And in these regions where that layer is lost, we have the adhesion of the retina to the underlying choroid. This clinically will then just cause some regions of hyperreflectivity. This generally not really cause that much of a problem in horses. And as I said, it's kind of, we have thought that maybe there was some vascular damage that ended up then predisposing to the regional loss of these cells that would perhaps lead to these changes. But it has been difficult to really confirm that, that association. Just something to keep in mind that you may see that primarily in older horses. In rats, there is something similar that they call linear retinopathy because from a clinical perspective, they may see these changes as linear regions. 
of hyperreflectivity throughout the fundus. And so again, you can see the adhesion of the retina then where retinal pigment epithelium would have been lost in these areas. It's unknown what really causes this. Now, remember that I mentioned retinal detachment being a problem that can occur after collection of the globe. And the reason is because we have this virtual space that, uh, that is being highlighted here as this black line here that represents a virtual space that is there as a result of the really very light opposition of the retina and onto the retinal pigment epithelium. If we have a lot of fluid that separates the retina from the rest, it's very obvious that that is a real change. But sometimes it can be a little tricky because sometimes you just see this completely detached retina and you may be in doubt as to whether this represents just a post-mortem change or whether that is actually real. If you're lucky, you already have the history that there was truly retinal detachment, but sometimes we have to figure that out on our own. And so one of the things to always look for is this tomb stoning or hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. So these cells get individualized and very prominent. That would indicate real retinal detachment. Here we can see that there is there are some cells and some fibrin and so on within the subretinal space. We have some displaced nuclei in this region here, and the photoreceptors are barely present here, are really just kind of forming these very little stumps of tissue. And so that would be the kind of change that we would want to see to make the diagnosis of real retinal detachment. Another change that can lead to retinal detachment is hemorrhage, as we have it here. Here we have the retina. And so when we have a lot of subretinal hemorrhage, as we have it here, we should always consider the possibility of hypertension. And so here we are in the choroid with a very thickened vessel wall. The lumen is barely apparent, and we have all this eosinophilic material. Sometimes you also get some foamy macrophages. If we have kind of some doubts whether that is a true change or not, PAS can really help in highlighting that type of change. In a normal vessel, we would only see some very thin kind of basement membrane um, that is present throughout the vessel wall and obviously a very dilated lumen in comparison to the very restricted lumen that we have in these changes. The choroid is generally the place where one can see this change best but it's also apparent in the retina. And as I said, it is associated generally with hypertension. And so um, hypertensive chorioretinopathy is often the way how we would refer to that. It is thought that probably with the increased pressure in the blood, we have some plasma leaking out into the wall. And that is what forms this type of material here. So if you get this type of change, you would certainly want to, and it's in a nucleated globe, you would certainly want to then indicate that you have evidence of hypertension and that they should be evaluating the thyroid glands of the cat, or basically you may then even have some cardiac changes that they perhaps have not recognized up to that point, or an underlying renal disease. Again, that they are dealing with a systemic disease that they need to investigate further in order to avoid that that progresses. So hemorrhage, here we have a somewhat advanced state of hemorrhage where one can see those hemocytin-laden macrophages of which we had a lot in that dog of the uh, dysplastic retina that I showed before. Uh, here we have the whole eye, all the eye chambers then filled with this blood. We really cannot make the diagnosis of the underlying cause other than in those cases where there is indication of hypertension. Um, because any coagulopathy, potentially trauma, uh, infections that lead to vascular changes, such as ehrlichia or so, can all potentially be underlying this. And it may very well represent a systemic disease. It's then in the hands of the veterinarian to further investigate the underlying problem. Now, just to conclude this discussion, 
In these cases where we do not have enucleation, where they may be treating the globe aggressively to a point where the inflammation or so subsides and you have scarring occurring in an attempt to repair the lesions, we may end up then with what often people just refer as thesis bobi, but atrophia bobi would actually be a better term to use if you're dealing with an intermediate state. The end result would then be potentially something as we have it here in this course with a very small globe within this large orbit. This, again, may be hard to diagnose uh, as an acquired versus a congenital change. Uh, age can then help, and certainly as you look at it histologically, you should then be able to see, is this just microphthalmia, or are we actually dealing with an acquired end stage globe? In this particular case, this was an eye that came from a horse on pasture that ran into a fence that was spooked and basically then ran into a fence and a few days, not a few, a few weeks later ended up showing up with ocular disease uh, in one eye. And so they brought it to our teaching hospital. At the time that they evaluated the globe clinically, they couldn't really tell exactly what was the underlying problem, but they knew it was severe enough that they needed to enucleate the horse. So they put it under anesthesia, and it was only under anesthesia when they were then going to be performing the enucleation that they saw that there was a stick that was poking into the eye. And so that basically was then leading to all these changes. So they removed that foreign body and submitted the eye for histologic evaluation. And so this is the cut surface. And so here we can get an idea where that foreign body, where that stick was poking into the eye and was basically then damaging all the structures along the way. But we can still kind of recognize the rest of the layers. We have a very prominent sclera. We have a chorite here with the retina still attached along the anterior aspect was really only inflammation and fibrosis and so on in this region here. The eye was already shrinking, but overall we can still recognize all the structures of the eye and definitely could do so histologically. So this would be a case where atrophia bulbi would be um, better than thesis bulbi when you basically lost all the internal structures of the eye, as was the case here where we basically can only recognize the sclera. And then interestingly enough, the uveal tract is generally preserved in these cases. So you can already here pick out this black layer that is lining the inner aspect of the sclera. And then we have a lot of soft material in the inner aspect of this lobe, which histologically actually turned out to be bone marrow type of material that was within some bony tissue that formed the entire inner aspect of the eye. And so again, we basically can just recognize the sclera and then the uveal tract and everything else was basically gone. So this is what we would then call thesis bulbi. It's basically the, the same way how we have end-stage liver, end-stage kidney disease, this would be end-stage ocular disease. There is no way that you can tell at this point what was the initiating problem. We are dealing with a globe that kind of completely shrank and, and scarred down and even had osseous metaplasia developing. If you ever have fibrosis and potentially disruption of the uveal layer, that would be an indication that there was a perforation. So fibrosis, for some reason, just never, it may surround and hug the uveal tract but within the uveal tract per se, the stroma remains the same. So if you ever have fibrosis that truly disrupts the uveal layer, that would be an indication that something perforated the globe and so allowed then fibrosis to develop in that location. All right, so that brings me to the end of this first part. So is there any question on these degenerative diseases? Which again, because of the glaucoma, are certainly a very important group of diseases that we end up seeing, both clinically as well as then certainly also histologically. There are no questions. We will have a break. Should we have a half an hour break?